Because you know it, I know. So this is what. I'm not taking your exam further. Because I will then ask for a month back and a year back. So, but this is what my kids, you are my kids. I'm, you know, now close to be dying next week or today or tomorrow. So I want to, to, to give you whatever I have in my experience. So my next request to you would be take maximum benefit of this small equipment that you have in your hand and try to, to, to because this is a good thing. And I'm next, this month I'm in Vienna talking about the digital transformation and ethics. What's happening to our young lot? Uh, what's our privacy? Where is our privacy? Everybody knows where I'm standing today because of my Google, because even if it's switch off, they know where I'm doing and what I'm doing. My privacy is no more there. So that's what we are talking and we are discussing these issues. Uh, so I hope it was like this. Yes. So today, what I'm going to talk to you uh, very quickly, maybe 40 minutes maximum, not keep you long, but it will not be mainly about, uh, you know, uh, the sequencing, the machines. Uh, uh, you have done enough. My lab is doing the same things, the sequencing. Uh, we, we are working with bats, taking all the bats viruses, and we are trying to find things, what, what's happening with zoonosis, the relation to biodiversity, a relation to, you know, synthetic biology, etc. Those details keeping aside. Here you should be at least understanding what is the relationship, why this institute is known as vaccine and genomics. So that is that's some basic few lines that I have drafted for you. That is because of these re reasons, six, seven reasons, that these two are very much needed together. And I appreciate your seniors that they gave this name to this institute of vaccine and genome together. Not many people say vaccine, uh, you know, laboratory or genome laboratory, but this is the good. And the reason are, you know, personalized medicine, you know, everybody, the vaccine sometimes works very good for one individual and kills the other one. It happened in COVID. So that is, you should understand uh, that why we need this institute together because the, it stimulates the, your immune system antigens from pathogen. So you have to understand the genetic makeups of both pathogen and yourself and your personal genetic differences. That is one. Then when you develop it, you need the genetic differences between individuals and then you tailored vaccine strategies for whatever community, whatever genome structure you are targeting. It's not that simple. You make a vaccine and do it to everybody. You, you heard about blood, blood clotting in certain individuals that, that died, not because of COVID, because of vaccine, but it's minimal. As I mean, the overall benefit was more, yet there were cases, and that is if you know the genomics of everybody, you understand blood clotting can happen where. And then thirdly, you go to efficacy and safety. Again, you need, you know, information that understand the human body and uh, if you have this, uh, the genomics, and then you understand emerging pathogens. That too, you need again genomics. What happened? Why, uh, uh, you know, COVID came to human? It wasn't bats. It was in the middle something. Still the theories, whatever the theories we have. Why it came to the human? And that again, you understand the RNA of all that. And then, uh, you know, uh, you and then you go more and then vaccine and genomics both are multidisciplinary. So your efforts to that spend genetics, immunology, virology, and public health. It all you need both the things. And finally, ethical consideration that you understand the privacy if you have genetics data, etc. How can you handle that? Little more. Uh, if you want to define it a bit of it, how can you, you know, uh, talk about it, why we need it, what is their purpose is? Of course, it's a basic question, but very quickly, uh, for prevention of diseases, for protection of vulnerable individuals, some of them, they need really vaccinations. If everybody doesn't. I'm not talking about this only COVID, but there are other diseases that genetics and others that you need to have such kind of thing. And then you go to, you know, 
uh, uh, control of outbreaks, of course, and public health and eradication of diseases, uh, research and scientific things, herd immunity. When the COVID came, there were two theories. One, quick vaccinations to leave some people to die. And finally, we get the resistance to it. This is what is called herd immunity. When a sufficient percent of population is vaccinated against diseases, it creates herd immunity, both vaccinated or not. And that is community immunity. That's what we call it. So these are a few things that you need to understand when you talk about it. Now, very quickly, how it works. I hope you all understand how the vaccine works, why you want to vaccine people, uh, vaccinate people. Recognition of the antigen first, then it goes activate uh, the antigen presenting cells, uh, goes to displaying antigen on T cells, going to the cell activation, production of antibodies, and memory cell formation, etc., etc. These are the mechanisms that vaccinate wants to have specifically for the students' purposes. How it works? Why you need vaccines? Then it comes to the different types of vaccine. A vaccine is not only one time. For a general common public, they may think, oh, vaccine. But vaccines means uh, you you have live attenuated, you have inactivated. Now you have messenger RNA vaccine. This is what I see the question. The last one that now uh, scientists are trying to have that uh, different types of vaccine. So live attenuated vaccine. Uh, that's uh, you know we can live form of the vaccine a bacteria and causes the disease. You weaken them, and this includes measles and mumps and rubella, etc. Then you go to inactivated, which are viruses and bacteria that have been killed or inactivated. Polio hepatitis is the example. Then you go to you know the uh, sub uh, subunit recombinant, recombinant and conjugate vaccines. Examples of you know hemophilus influenza and hepatitis B. Then you go to you know others viral DNA. Oxide vaccination, et cetera, et cetera. Again, of time, I'm, uh, I'm, I have already sent this presentation. You can just go through it and understand what types of vaccine do you have. Now, the problem is, this is a couple of slides that I kept here, are what happened in uh, the COVID vaccination and how, uh, you know, the rich were getting it, poor were waiting for it. I'm talking about the countries, least developed countries and others. Uh, but the WHO slogan is that no one is safe unless everybody is safe. So even if you vaccinate the rich and leave the poor, you are not safe. The rich are not safe even then. So there is that, that, that policy, there were some decisions, people were talking about it. I think we have an excellent two of the similar nature, not. I kept it few. So there was a lot of who and cry that the data was showing that rich countries were getting faster, poor countries. The whole continent of Africa did not produce a single dose of vaccine. So that was the dilemma of the humans where rich gets everything and poor is left to die. But in this case, if you don't keep them alive, you will die too because the movement a virus will not uh, understand who is rich, who is poor. Even if you vaccinate yourself, you will have problems. So that is that WHO or uh, you not trying about that. Now, a little bit about genomics and it's uh, why why we, we discuss these two words. One, the structure, genomics, evolutionary insight, biotechnology, agriculture, conservation, and biodiversity. You all, your institute is working on almost all of these. And that's why everywhere you need genomics. And now for GMO, for example, CRISPR-Cas9, if you're instituted working or not, but in future you can. Uh, people, public and NGOs may object on GMOs, but in CRISPR case, you don't uh, you know, import a gene or a, a, a part of a gene to the crop. In fact, you make changes within the crop. So that is one. You remove some part, you add some part within that. You activate that. So that some people say it's not now uh, genetically modified in a term that you don't insert something from the outside. 
So that's the question that uh, your institute is doing almost every bit of it. So great to be here, uh, talk about it. Now, when we, we I, as I said, personalized medicine, etc. So genetic variation is important to understand individual response to disease and treatment. That are that you need to understand how it really works, right from the drug metabolism to adverse drug reaction, cancer treatment, precise, precision medicine, therapeutic development. You talk about it, disease progression, drug efficacy, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So whatever disease susceptibility, so that is, if we conclude, you need to understand the genetic variation now. This is the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, take it that way, that these four alphabet, A, T, C, G, is right from the bacteria to yourself. Everything is made of those four alphabets. <coughs> Excuse me. Keeping it, you know, here and there, and uh, thank you, young man. I'm an old side, may not be able to open it. So that's why you talk about vaccine, you need genomics data. And that data, we all are different. Look at here, one species, same species, and everybody is different, even from father and mother. So that is the creation. And that is what you need to understand. And that is if you different partners marries, that's why this is good that the diversity makes then the offspring little bit getting maximum good from the parents. These are the things that you need to understand when you talk about vaccines and others. And here, uh, genetic factors that influence vaccine. I'm sorry, we cannot turn on this uh, presentation mode because the online cannot see once we set into. Now they can see it. Good, good, good. No problem. Oh, your screen is very good, so it's good. Now, the genetic factor that influence uh, vaccine responses, uh, how, what are those? One, human leukocyte antigens genes, that cytokine genes, then antibody response genes, inmate immune receptor genes, and you talk about it, genetic predisposition to inflammation, to allergic reaction, immune system regulation gene, genetic diversity in pathogen target sites, ethnic and population differences. Like in your own community, you have Chinese origin, you have you know Malay, you have others. So that you need to understand uh, all of this. Interaction with environmental factors too, pollution and others that, uh, you know, uh, we have problems, and even the food. We in our country, probably among the top few countries having uh, breast cancer reports, and now we are looking for the causes, whether for junk food, whether environment, and how it happens. So that are that your genetic data will tell you all those information for you. I think I already talked about it, so. Now, what is this important of genetic diversity in vaccine research and development? Uh, if you talk of from the one optimizing vaccine efficacy, the, the quantity, you know, some have booster vaccines, some doesn't, others, one, two, three, or some even that, the time period, how long it will help in the body, et cetera, et cetera. So that efficacy and the dose Again, genetic data, science will, you know, is progressing so fast that if your institute gives some good data about these different populations, then we understand the dose and the efficacy of vaccines. Tailoring vaccine to the population within your country, for example. You are such a beautiful country, beautiful human beings, from Chinese to Malay to other to Indian origin and so forth and so on. So that diversity is like, you know, a bucket of flowers having beautiful people all around. So that you need to understand, uh, and then you can predict vaccine response. You can reduce adverse reactions to have vaccines. That's what we discuss and have the medicine. And then, of course, clinical trials, et cetera, understanding immune mechanisms, and of ethical consideration everywhere. I work with Comest, 
uh, UNESCO, World Commission for Ethics in Science and Technology, we, we discuss the issues of the individualized uh, you know, problem. Uh, now, personalized vaccine, what future we see when we have an institute like yours, genomics and vaccines, that I'm trying to, to keep it to my mouth close, like a singing or song, but I'm sorry. You have to when edit when you send me this presentation because sometimes my habit is having fun and joke even in my classrooms. So it, it happens. Anyway, that's good to keep you alive, to drag you sometime here and there because in teaching, if it's one way, after 10 minutes, everybody gets sleep or thinks about their loved ones. So just to change the topic. Coming here, personalized vaccine. How will it happen? If you have genomic data, if that discipline goes faster, that gets good data, uh, that will have enable in the future, next five, 10 years, that every individual science will know what kind of vaccine that individual needs. And that is the, the, the recommendation will be done based on uh, you know genomic data and then optimizing vaccine schedules, you know, the dose, the interval, the time, the boosters, everything will be decided based on genomic data. And you will even be able to predict what X vaccine will do with that body, with different bodies. And vaccine safety, adverse reaction, development of targeted vaccines, and then uh, ethnic geographical consideration again, as I said, different population, different um, clinical trial validation and population health. This is based on advances in genomics. This is what you, if you do, you, you get it. And now then this personalized vaccine, how genetic information can guide you for recommendation, vaccine recommendation. That is the disease susceptibility. Who is more susceptible to the disease? We will understand which population is more inclined to get what kind of disease? So that is some people, like my family says, if a mosquito bite me, me. He says, mosquito will die, not you. Because they, they, they're so, you know, I have an angry looking face. So my children think that mosquito will certainly die if he tries to, to, to suck my blood. I don't know, but it happened so far. Well, of course, there were some uh, mosquito lying on my bed sheet, red blood. <laughs> so this is what, uh, you know, uh, I'm talking about disease susceptibility. Who is more susceptible for what? And then, of course, we, uh, that vaccine responsiveness, uh, the variants, HLA, what we are talking about, vaccine allergies, etc., etc. Yeah, again, getting it a bit faster because we have a lot of slides to, to show you. Uh, again, with this personalized vaccines, the benefits and challenges when you tailor a vaccine based on genome. What are the benefits? Uh, reduce uh, adverse reaction, improved effect, uh, effectiveness, enhance protection, etc., etc. And the other challenges that today we have for this is influence of non-genetic factor, that is climate, that is where do you live, what kind of work do you do? If you are in a factory with a lot of dust, etc., those things that you are beyond the control, public perception. Some people say, even in my country, uh, people were reluctant to have COVID vaccine. They said, they, specifically the woman, they said it makes a woman infertile if you have a vaccine. This was a rumor. Again, misuse of the social media, uh, what we call it infodemics. So that's another that vaccine supply logistic. Uh, in the mountain regions, another region, desert region, how you uh, reach there, ethical consideration, and of course the complexity of the genes. Uh, still, we know we need to know a lot about the junk DNA, for example. Maybe we for now five to seven percent is well known, but the rest of ninety-three percent of junk DNA, its role in major things, are still need to be discovered. Surveillance. Uh, of pathogens, so how you do it, how should you do it, right from the identification, sequencing you do, DNA, RNA, whatever, and then source tracing, another question, like in this, the whole world was involved, still there are question marks, whether it was from the wet market and 
how it spread. Some people may even doubt it was from the lab. So the, the, those kind of things that we need to really discuss and uh, we really have to look into it. And then transmission routes, epidemiology, and real-time monitoring. This is uh, analysis of tracking a disease outbreaks and mutations. If there is an outbreak, if something comes in, so how you do? Mutation hotspots, you remember something happened in South Africa when there is the vaccine, and then the whole world said South Africa should be closed border, no, but you can uh, out the whole, you know, almost half of the continent. So those are the questions that uh, uh, challenges and, uh, you know, uh, things are there, vaccine development, resistance, of course, and tracking the variants. And here comes the data for human analysis. Bioinformatics is very important again. Artificial intelligence is there. You need to, to understand all those mechanisms, data sharing, collaboration. What I, why I'm here to request you that at least from Islamic Academy of Sciences, we should share the information with uh, among each other. We should have some kind of a, you know, with this modern world, Every, uh, and I believe that uh, we are like a body. If uh, one portion has some problem, the other feels the pain. So that is that if we could try to, to work on it. Again, role of vaccine in development and modification. Examples are flu and COVID. From monitoring to variants to resistance to specific vaccine to, you know, booster dose development, what kind of real-time efficacy, so that, uh, you know, there are a lot of challenges that we still need to answer if we find a solution to that. Real-world examples of genomic surveillance influencing vaccine strategy. The example that what happened so far, <coughs> excuse me, like in the influenza vaccine, high mutation rate, new variants emerges quickly, and adjustments are made in the vaccine timely. These are the These are the really, uh, uh, you know, real world examples. COVID-19, we had variants, beta, gamma, delta, et cetera, et cetera. And still uh, we are working on it because uh, we are not 100% safe yet. Ebola and go on and on, rotavirus, pneumonia, uh, meningococcal, et cetera. So there are, there are challenges. There are things that it's not that you had a vaccine and uh, story finishes. You, you need to work more and more. But genomics has revolutionized vaccine development by providing everything about the you know, pathogen. Their immune responses and host pathogen interaction. That is what makes us like uh, to understand identify, from identification to characterization to design of the vaccine, prediction immune system, synthetic biology, vaccine adjuvant, uh, adjuvants, and you know, all this. So what you, this is what the genomics has helped for the vaccine. If you don't have genomics, the vaccine is not enough uh, to, to get all this. So, in this era of genomics, bioinformatics, and artificial intelligence, machine learning, uh, what, they, what has made it faster identification of vaccine targets, and that is right from the pathogen sequencing, and then going towards getting in silico production, in accelerated vaccine development, you know, earlier it would compare it to genomics, etc. Earlier it was taking almost 10 years to get something out. Now it has been done very quickly. So that is the, uh, the, the integration or interdisciplinary work that, that helps us. Some case studies of vaccine development from HPV, human, papillomavirus, pneumonia, and meningitis, and COVID, rotavirus. These are the, you know, some very good examples for successful development vaccine. And as, as I said, yesterday you, you read the Nature article, <laughs> getting some information about the malarial next vaccine. 
Let's talk about ethical consideration because I work for Commerce, which is a uh, World Commission for Ethics, you know, dual use of science and all this. So here is that you need to understand, one, informed consent, you have to educate people. You have to, to not to just, you know, put needle in everybody's body. That is the one. And then data privacy and ownership, the problem is, if you get the data about, let's say, all the different uh, kind of uh, population uh, that we have, uh, Chinese and Malays and others and others, but their privacy, their data, how you keep that, equity and inclusion, as I said in the beginning, poverty and others issues, genetic uh, determinations, and unintended consequences that uh, something may happen drastic because science is never perfect. We should understand the difference between the religion and science. Science needs solid, you know, uh, evidence that you use for that. And then access and benefit sharing, uh, future use, public trust, and vaccine mandates and autonomy. These are the ethical considerations that your institute should be educating the policymaker and the public about all this. And a little more about the privacy concern. If, if I focus now on privacy, like data breaches and security, re-identification of risk, secondary uses of data, not only for this purpose, but for watching those citizens or the you know other uh, agencies, uh, discrimination sometimes, stigmatization, job opportunities. If they know that this one population has that one disease, that will they will die rather quickly. So jobs and other insurance, etc. Uh, family privacy, informed consent, third party sharing, equity, lack of control, global data sharing, etc. These are the things that we need to understand. When an individual gives you the data and the consent, how can we assure that it's not misused by people? Uh, and if you talk about ethics in ensuring equitable access to the personalized medicine, uh, that is genetic diversity, uh, inclusiveness, reducing health disparity for all the population, global collaboration, affordable genetic testing, healthcare infrastructure, public health, and universal health care, et cetera, et cetera, government support, regulation, partnership and alliances. This is what I started from the beginning, that we all as SDG 17, irrespective of caste, color, religion, we try to see, to see human as an entity, and we should, well, I use the English word, color blind commitment. For us, everyone is, say, uh, you know, same, Human, be, human, uh, human, and that we should not discriminate anybody by any color, caste, or religion, or whatever. So that's another thing that we globally we have to work on it. Some future direction, uh, advancement in uh, uh, like uh, how it can happen, personalized vaccine, epigenetics, universal flu vaccine, uh, personalized cancer vaccines, AI and data analysis based on your work on that. Multiomics, you know, the proteomics, metabolomics, and all that. A vaccine platform, designer vaccines, novel antigen, et cetera, et cetera. This is that the potential that your institute should be thinking on these lines for the future ahead of time. Not of today, but of the 10 years, 20 years, midterm and long term uh, things that you can relate. Integration of artificial intelligence, for example, in mach and machine learning in predictive vaccine. It's a very good thing that if you use for good. And that, that can help you a lot from the system biology modeling to genetic variation, to rapid response, to clinical trial, to data integration, to whatnot. So you should be using your institute shed. Um, you may have bioinformatics, but you try to have a little more advanced of machine learning and artificial intelligence so that you have more data at your hand to work on it. Important thing is global direct collaboration. That's the most important, SDG 17, that we all should work together. For what? Data sharing, pooling resources. This will help us to have diversity uh, representation 
identification of conserved targets, I mean, in your own genomes and in pathogen genomes, ovarian surveillance, et cetera, et cetera. Rapid response will be result of that, and public health impact will be great. For that, we need funding and support and reduce redundancy that nobody, you know, duplicate the wars, et cetera. But all this should be based on ethical consideration that the data if we share globally that is not misused and, uh, you know, uh, is the benefit for the benefit of the humankind. Some existing potential of combining vaccine and genome. What the potential we get if you have an institute like this, uh, that is personalized vaccine strategies, precision, uh, predictive vaccine responses, eradicating vaccine preventable diseases, rapid response, optimal immune stimulation, global equity, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And that will help you finally preventing pandemics. If you work together, if you have such institutes that works with the global uh, parties, that will help. I just go rather quick, only three, four slides, maybe more. Uh, this is an example of, uh, you know, uh, a world first DNA vaccine and clinical trial that they, they are working, the modern thing. There are several examples uh, th that how they, they have surpassed. But this was one of the examples that I was seeing, that this was stopped because of blood clotting. One of my friend who was vice chancellor of a university, he was okay. He just went for vaccine, got hospitalized, and three days he was gone. So that is the some, some example. This is what maybe one in million, but there is an example. Maybe, uh, you know, a million people benefited, but still we should try that science should save, save that one individual also. So that is how you, uh, uh, this all uh, things. Now there are success stories and good things also that because of this COVID, African continent may have in future their own vaccine. As I said, the whole continent couldn't produce anything for their thing. So with the help of yours and others, they will be able in future to have uh, things available for themselves. Why is it uh, uh, difficult sometimes? There is a network, and of course there, there may be the people that they work, many companies, many labs, and it is really like this. IPR issues, intellectual properties, and all this. You know, many people are involved, and to get it, uh, uh, the technology to the developing country makes it really very difficult. So what we need to do is that we need to have our own system of somehow collaborating among ourselves and getting standing on, on our own feet, not begging to others. This is what World Trade Organization stopped poor to get vaccines. Why? They said, oh, there are issues related to World Trade Organization that you cannot give technology to somebody. So that is that we think whether money is important, trips, what they call it, or trade-related aspects of intellectual property rights. So as a human, this materialized world, where 20, 26 humans, 26 persons have more wealth than 50% of the bottom population of the humans. 3.5 billion people have less wealth than 26 individuals. So that is the issue that we really need to speak about. That what's, and in COVID, 99% people suffered, 1% people got their wealth doubled. Using this as an opportunity for themselves at the cost of 99% human beings. So those are the issues again that we need to talk about. So, now, at a bigger level, uh, the global vaccine manufacturing capacity, people are thinking, as I, I proposed to you, that we will be sending, you can talk to your own, you know, boards and bodies and things that, let's work together, share our intellectual things, our labs, our, you know, whatever, human data, something that is good for the human at a bigger platform. That is, should be our next target, how can we work together and have and this is what globally they are thinking that we should really think about all these issues that are really stopping us. 
Here I thank you. The, the names are missing, especially the CEO, Khatija, the chairperson, and Tom, who, who is kidnapping me from the hotel to here and will be releasing me back to the hotel. If I perform better, otherwise he will keep me here locking in the room. I hope he doesn't lock me in the room and he send me back. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. If there is any question, I'm here to respond. We still have a few minutes to talk about. Yeah. We can spend, yeah, if there is somebody on online, even if they have, they can write in chat, somebody's watching it. Uh, we are opening the floor for questions. So if you have any questions for Prof, you haven't had your drink. Uh, please, uh, you haven't had your drink. For those um, that are online, you can write your questions in the chat and I'll read it out. Thank you. Assalamu uh, alaikum. Uh, uh, thank you for your talk. Uh, my question is on a slightly different um, kind of tangent. Um, you know, as you explain, the scientific advances made in genomics and vaccines are certainly amazing to behold. I mean, um, a lot of how we were able to mitigate the COVID-19 impact was actually due to the advances made in mRNA vaccine technology and so on. Um, however, on the flip side, we've also seen the emergence of um, diseases that were previously thought to be eradicated. Um, you know, like measles, polio, polio, and so on, just simply due to, um, you know, and the anti a lack of education. So um, I would like just to get your opinion. Um, are we too focused on the science and the development of science rather than public education, especially considering in terms of the birth rates? Um, we definitely... Across a lot of countries, um, the birth rates for the people on different socioeconomic status, the people that are lower economic status usually have bigger families and more people, more, more, uh, more children, as opposed to the ones that theoretically have better education and better access to healthcare and so on. So, what's your opinion on that? Excellent question, and I 100% agree with you. Your last statement about the population growth. There are some countries that are rich. They, they buy our youth in a way. They migrate, brain drain, and go there. That, that's 100% true. And we all, uh, because of religion, because of other issues, uh, I belong to a country where there are children, like, you know, <laughs> every night something comes out. So uh, there, there are problems, and you're 100% correct that except for me, that I am uh, few, I have few uh, years of education, uh, but others, uh, and I still have big family, others, these, the, uh, you know, uh, those who are low income have more children than the education. I agree, this is universal part of developing country. But developed world, they even don't bother to have a single one. They say, why should I, uh, you know, disturb my body? Why should I should spend my life and I, why I need to? So th that's another issue. Coming back to the education science, uh, there is another topic someday, we, if you invite me again, I will come and we talk about science with and for society. You know, the problem with us is that sometimes science communication, for example, this field, you all are brilliant scientists. But for example, there was a COVID, there was a lot of misinformation, but nothing came out. I mean, if I say nothing, nothing doesn't mean nothing. But from some, because the, the, the you know, sensational words are more uh, attracts young people than the statement of a science, uh, very simply written, it's not the case like this. For example, somebody said, uh, drink bleach, you will be cured. And many people died. And this, this statement was from the head of a country, I think. So you can imagine the information. So that's again, the thing is that we should use excess of the most modern technology available based on the data and et cetera. And you educate your student, as I said, everything is in your mobile chat GPT. Yesterday I received a letter from a student for PhD admission and everything was, he just, wrote something for chat GPT, and I know because I used it myself. 
So the letter was so politely written that I thought he is coming somewhere from the moon. <laughs> but as I am a student of the chat GPT, so I knew it. And I said, uh, in our language, we call it beta, son. Son, write in your own language so that I understand what you want. So the thing is that we have two, three things in mind. One, to educate our youth, to use maximum benefit of the modern technology for good. If you engage them, you give them something, they will spend, let's say, 10% of their, you know, writing to girls and boyfriends uh, chat in the midnight. They can do something on science. But if you try to involve them, you know, with academia too, the problem is, I don't know about Malaysia, but in my country, my promotion is an impact factor, H index, citation, blah, 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 this thing. Never with, like I'm here today, this, this carries some math, but science communication, telling to the society, going helping people doesn't carry anything. And that is our main job. Because we will die one day, as I said, I'm going soon. I have spent my whole, you know, the major portion and a little left probably. So we should try every one of us. My lab is probably the first in the world that takes an oath when he, he she graduates that I will do this, this, this good ethics. Access. They do it or not is another story, but we try to at least educate them. And every teacher should be in their class. Oh, we call it 2.5% zakat of their time on character building on such issues. Your questions are very pertinent, but we need more interaction together. Even if I cannot come physically, like people are listening to me online, my students may have joined a few of them. So, and that's why I asked for recording too. I have a channel, I'm trying to spread these messages. So let's do the thing, the question that you asked in the beginning, we all need to be in touch with the society. Thank you. Any questions from the floor and online? Uh, maybe just a question from Ipov. So uh, you touched on different vaccine platforms and also personalized vaccines. So in your opinion, like uh, which vaccine platforms would be the most, how to say, most used moving forward? And also, do you think uh, when will we see personalized vaccines, just in your opinion? If the world goes the fast that it is going, next 10 years you will have a lot of good news about the personalized vaccine, etc. number one. Number two, even this is one story of the eternity of life, lifespan. You know, if the science, unfortunately, today was a bit focused on this, when I uh, Khatija wrote me about the title of your institute, so I focused on this. Otherwise, there was other things that we could have taught. Uh, eternity, lifespan of human being. What do we expect next 50 years? Synthetic biology. Now we have a human embryo grown from chemicals. Not even something uh, from stem cells. Only from your ears. So things are moving that fast. Eternity now we have some many people in 100 years of age. Not one, two, but many. When I was studying in Japan, it was only five or 10 people at that time of 100 years of age. Now they have maybe hundreds. And same will happen. So if the science goes that fast, the question is that sometimes the science and the companies are more for their personal benefits, unfortunately. And they, they, they are more focused to get more and more and money, billions and billions of daughter, uh, dollars. And I'm surprised that their stomach doesn't fill with those dollars. So if we focus on humanity, you can eradicate the infectious diseases, non-communicable diseases, and the lifespan will increase. And so is true with the vaccines, that this technology will bring DNA vaccines another very quickly now. Maybe in the next five years, you will get it, inshallah. Shall I say thank you very much? If there's no further questions for Prof. Zatta, uh, on behalf of MGBI, we thank him for his time. Uh, before leaving, uh, I request all together in the middle just for a quick photo. Uh, uh, please, uh, please gather with me. Thank you.
Thank you, and especially to see you, Madam Raha and uh, Khatija and uh, Madam and yourself, Khan. Thank you, and thank you for the hospitality and everything that you arranged. Madam, thank you very much. Yeah.